Um, usually I would get probably eight or nine people in here. Yeah. Two, three, four, I'd five. I'd say yeah, just kick it right and anybody else could just join. Yeah. I think I'm going to just kick it. And I'm recording it too. Cool. Um, all right. So let me get my tablet ready then. All right, today we're gonna to do combat formations and we can also review the five paragraph order if you guys want. You gotta let me know, cause I'm pretty sure combat formations are not gonna take a whole hour anyways. But the reason I chose to do uh, combat formations is because on Saturday we were practicing our sulis and I realized a lot of you understood what was going on and you knew how to translate an order. But when you got to the execution, you had no idea what to put there because we hadn't gone over tactics. So hopefully by covering this today, next Saturday and Saturday after that, we can go over a, a full Suli and I could see your order all the way through and hopefully even some squad level Suli. Uh, so today we're doing a combat formations and they haven't really changed in a long time as you can see because this PowerPoint slide, I stole it from someone and it's from June of 2003 and it's it's verbatim. It's the same stuff that you're gonna learn at OCS. It hasn't really changed. Um, and of course the stuff in real life has changed a lot, I'm sure, because of the war on terror and everything. So but at OCS we're not we're not they're not training you to uh, to be a tactical, you know, efficient leader. You know, they're training they're just checking you and screening you to see if you have the ability to lead. That's it. So by teaching you some basic patterns, they can see if you're able to follow through with orders and lead. So what everyone wants to be is this guy right here leading your uh, your squads through their columns. Um, so there's some basic definitions. I'm sure you guys can all guess, but let's just say it. Combat formations, fire team, and squad formations are groupings of individuals and fire teams for efficient tactical employment. These have a lot of factors. At OCS, they break it down into six factors. Mission, weather, terrain, speed, situation, and flexibility. And um, some of those cover, you know, some of those cover your situation, your op order, and some of them cover your orientation, you know, but you're gonna kind of have to figure it out as you go. Sometimes the mission you get, you receive is more stealthy, and sometimes it's based on speed, or sometimes it's resupply. So it really depends on what you're given. Uh, let's see. Each unit leader makes a formation of his own unit. He determines it. And you will, you're all going to determine your own formations when you go to OCS. Uh, the relative positions of the unit with a uh, formation should not mask the fire of another. And what that means is if you have three guys, right, and you're attacking an enemy. Oh, let me make my thing full screen. Does it work? Oh, yeah, there it goes. Okay. Yeah. If you're attacking an enemy, Right. What you don't want to do is I'm going to color it in green. You don't want this guy moving in front of this guy because now only one of them can shoot at a time. And if they both shoot at the same time, this guy's going to get smacked. So you don't you want to make sure that you're controlling the situation at all times and you're not masking each other. Um, yeah, it says here the exact distances of intervals should be maintained, but it's not important to. Uh, it's not important to be super exact. Uh, I think at OCS, what was it? Melville, it was like six to eight feet per person for intervals. It's like 10 to 15 meters, but 10 to 15? the spacing is, I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, that sounds like, that sounds right. It's something 15 like 15 meters between people. So the spacing becomes more important because what they're going to do is they're going to watch your guys' spacing. And once you're a billet holder, like a fire team leader or a squad leader, they want to see how well you can control your people. And it becomes more important because once you get here to TBS, you start using live ammunition and you have to be right next to each other, running down a long distance, shooting live ammunition. So spacing is very important. Otherwise, when you're there, um, it's happened to people where they'll straight up 
there's uh, sergeants, corporals, all infantrymen standing behind you while you're on a live fire range, buddy rushing. And if you start to kind of get close to the person next to you, they'll come, they'll take the magazine out of your weapon while you're firing and either take you off the range or they'll just straight up make it so that you can't shoot anyone. So spacing is really important because you could straight up kill the guy next to you if you're not paying attention. Yeah. Yeah, spacing is super important. Um, and I've also heard, uh, I don't know if I covered in the slides, I forgot, but if you're like in a really open area, like a desert or a big valley, you're gonna wanna even open that up even wider. And if you're in something like a jungle, you're probably not gonna have a choice, but you're gonna have to contract in a little bit because there's so much trees that you can't see each other. And you wanna maintain visible contact at all times. Um, and the movement, all movements of change formation should be quick. So if you're gonna switch from, uh, let's say you're switching from a diamond wedge shape to a skirmishers, you don't wanna take your, free, uh, your sweet time doing that. You wanna do it as fast as possible. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with the fire team, which is the lowest level element of uh, Marine Corps units. Well, except for the buddy pairs, but the smallest formation that you're gonna use at OCS is the fire team. And they're broken down with four components. And we've talked about them before, if you guys remember. So when you're practicing Sulis, you're the team leader. And you have three guys under your control. Remember, remember uh, the rule of threes. So when you're a squad leader, you have three fire teams under you. Uh, when you're a platoon, you have, when you're a platoon leader, you have three squads under you. So it just it just cascades down all the way. Uh, let me close my window. There's a helicopter. All right, what was I saying? Yeah, so when you're practicing your Sulis, you're the, you're the team leader or you're the squad leader, whatever it is, and the symbol is here. It's just a circle with a, with a uh, dash across it. You're ready is the lowest level man. He's like a PFC or a private, and he's the point man usually, or he's the guy with just a regular rifle, okay? And then you have your fire, and they call it that because he's usually the machine gunner or he has the heavy rifle or whatever you're using at the time. And he's symbolized with this big arrow in the center of the circle. And um, then the last guy here is the assist. And he's important because these two guys, they usually work together. And if you're carrying a machine gun and you're in heavy contact, you're gonna need to switch out your barrels if they overheat or you're gonna need to use extra ammo or someone has to carry a tripod, whatever it is. So he carries the extra equipment and the three of you work together in a fire team. You guys have any questions on that one? That's pretty, pretty uh, low level. The hard part's gonna be remembering which symbol's which in the, in the nick of time. I mean, you all know intuitively, you just don't remember it. Squad leader symbol. Um, he's the extra guy in charge of the squad, but it's just the X and it's colored in, as you can see. Um, I never really use the symbols at OCS personally, but a lot of people did. I would rather just draw a circle and I put an S in the middle of it, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, so now we're going to go into the first thing, which is fire team columns. And if you guys use Excel or if you study Roman history, you know that columns are a big part of them, but that's what they do. They're known for that. So here you can see that the unit is moving forward and they're walking in each other's footsteps. And they're doing that to minimize the amount of ground that they're covering. Like they don't wanna be stepping everywhere. That way that if one person steps on a bomb, um, the next guy next to him over here won't step on a bomb as well. At least at least he'll be uh, covering the lines. And this, this sort of movement allows you to move uh, faster and like if you're covering down a road, this is like the way you want to move because you could stay on the sides of the road and walk in a straight pattern like this. And it, the main benefit is that you can travel faster. Fire team wedge. Oh, I'm sorry. I totally forgot the position of everyone. Um, that's what I forgot to mention here. The point man is at the front, team leader is usually the second guy, right? So you have this like Z pattern. 
That's how I like to remember it as a Z. And then you have your fire and your assisted in the rear. Okay. So the ditty is usually just R T F A. Ready team fire assist. That's a good way to remember it. Just that little line. Ready team fire assist. Boom. You'll never forget it. Uh, fire team wedge. You have your point man. And this is where you can kind of choose. You can you can tell your uh you can kind of pick where you're gonna be, whether it's this side or that side. There's not really much of a difference unless unless you know where the enemy is gonna be, maybe you would want to be on the opposite side of if you know the enemy's to your left, then maybe you would want to be on your right. Um but an important keynote here is that the the fire is in the rear. And that's so that he can have the biggest range of fire. And it covers this whole back area like this. And the wedge facilitates 360 security. So if you're walking through a forest and let's say your situation is enemy was seen 10 hours ago, so you're not entirely sure where the enemy is, and they could be anywhere in the woods, or they're setting up booby traps of some sort, then you would want to walk with more security. So this is a situation where you use that. Skirmishers. Skirmishers are more used for um, when you get to that point, the line of departure, and you're passing into the uh, assault position and going on to the objective. You spread out in this pattern so that you could all fire to the front, so you can all fire at the enemy at the same time. And you could have uh, sup fire superiority over the enemy. Um, but this spacing still has to remain. Right. And, okay, so you guys see I have these two differences here, right? Skirmishers right and skirmishers left. The difference is, so you have your ready, your team, your fire, and your assist. But the way you can tell the difference between skirmishers right and left is that you have to think about it from the perspective of the team leader. So if the team leader is here, skirmishers right indicates that the fire, the big heavy gun is to your right. That's the indicator. So if I tell you skirmishers right, then you look at the team leader and you say, okay, the fire has to go to the right. If you say skirmishers left, the formation is exactly the same, but here's the team leader and to your left is the fire. Same thing goes for echelons. And I'm gonna skip right to it here. So echelons, you get this pattern. And this was never really used at OCS, echelons left and right, because it doesn't really look that good when you're trying to present it and get graded and evaluated on your SULIs. So I would personally recommend not to do uh, any echelons at OCS. <laughs> but in the real world, they're pretty useful because this is how you do flank maneuvers, or this is how you do probing maneuvers or whatever you're doing. It's it's much more useful when you have bigger units. But if it's just the four of you, I'd recommend sticking to skirmishers and columns and wedges. Those are the three, the three three most useful ones. But the rule still applies here. So you have fire team right, right? Fire team echelon right. Whatever you're doing, if it's fire team right, you look you look at the team leader, and you know that the big guy, the fire, is to your right. Echelon left. You look at the team leader, and you know that the fire is to your left. A lot of people get those mixed up, and it's honestly not that big of a deal because you all have the same weapon at OCS, and you're probably going to forget who your fire was anyways. But when you're first starting out your call, when you when you uh, when your mission starts and you haven't hit the enemy yet, they're going to be grading you on your uh, your form of and maneuver and all that. Are they going to be grading you on uh, how you place your teammates? So if you get them mixed up, like if you tell someone to be the, if you tell someone that they're the assist, and then you put them in the front, uh, you might get deducted for that depending on your instructor. But I never had a problem with that personally, but I've heard of it. Squad formations. So I kind of skipped, I kind of went pretty fast through the uh, fire team formations because they're pretty self-explanatory. I'll just draw them again. So you just have your columns, right? And you could do it like this. Now I remember that as like a Z or a lightning bolt. 
I'm gonna call it column. Okay. And then you have your diamond, which is your wedge. They call it a wedge, but I remember it as a diamond. And that's 360 security, right? So I remember these with the with their ditties as well. I just remember fast. 360. And then you have your skirmishers. And for skirmishers, I just remember it as the attack position. And then you have your uh, echelon. And I don't really know the benefit of using echelon personally in a fire team or squad level tactic. Uh, Melville, if you have a reason why you would use echelons, I'd be glad to hear it, but I personally don't know any reason why you would. I never personally used them at OCS, but it's mainly for full fire to a certain direction where the enemy is going. I'm sorry, where enemy location is known to be. That's so, true. If, yeah, if yeah so I believe it's the echelon. Um, yeah, the echelon, I believe that that arrow is actually for where the enemy position potentially is, like where you expect enemy contact. And yeah. if it's if it's generally unknown. I believe it's the column that you use or the uh, wedge formation. Yeah, the column, so, the, the wedges are the wedges for uh, security. The column is for moving fast in one direction, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And like, like you generally what you're doing at OCS during Sulu 1 or Sulu 2 is you're just walking in a direction where they give you like they say hey shoot this azimuth walk in that direction and eventually you'll just start getting shot at by something or by somebody off in the distance and you have to work with your team to uh originally come up with a with a movement formation like echelon skirmishers whatever and then once you make contact you have to, everybody has to know how to get online and start attacking the enemy yeah so what, he, what he's talking about is um it, it's hard it's easy to be in any of these formations right there's there's basically just four different types of formations but the hard part is if you're in one of these formations you have to know how to respond if you're attacked um, so if you're in a column formation, right, then people have to split off and make an even front and then attack. And we'll go over that in a second. You have to basically split off, get into one even front like a skirmishers and then attack forward. If you're in a wedge, same thing. It, basically all of these formations are the same way. The, the, the real goal is to be in skirmishers formation before you get attacked. Um, but that's not always possible because sometimes they'll tell you the enemy is like uh, 50 or 500 meters away. And the enemy's actually only 250 meters away. So then you walk right into them and you get attacked when you're in uh, in a different formation. But that's part of the practice. Do they so, know about getting online yet? I think I go over that later on in the slides. I'm pretty sure I do. If not, I'll explain it. Yeah, I go over squad line. You know, so getting I online I just over means getting in a straight line, shoulder to shoulder, facing the enemy. That's it. Yeah. Actually, I forgot to put that in the slide. Or I guess I didn't make these slides. <laughs> I should have added that to the end. Dang it. I mean, it, oh. I didn't even, it's a big part of it because these formations, it's just a way of moving so that you can protect full 360 around you. Because if you're in the back of the wedge or whatever, whatever formation you're doing, you're in charge of the rear. If you're to the left, you're in charge. Of of left whatever um and i'll read that question in a second and uh when they say when you make contact that's when you get online so everybody literally gets shoulder to shoulder facing a direction but you're about 10 to 15 meters apart and you have to just buddy rush with your buddy towards the enemy so um it's all about fire and maneuver. This whole this whole thing is fire and maneuver. It means shooting the enemy, but also moving closer and closer to them so that you could destroy them. 
So they, yeah. there's this saying they have at TBS. It's like something like um, fire without maneuver is suicide, but maneuver without fire is, I don't know, something like that. Um, no, I'm sorry. It's firing without maneuvering is a waste of ammo. Maneuvering without firing is suicide. So the whole point of this is that once you get online, you start moving towards the enemy, closing in on them and destroying them. And once you get to TBS, you start doing it at the squad level. Uh, I mean, you do it a little bit at OCS too, the squad level, which is like 16 to 18 people. But here at TBS, we also do get online at the platoon level. So we have 50 guys online rushing towards an enemy. It's, it's pretty sick. Sounds like fun. <laughs> when we get into contact, we expected to we expected to see cover and then position our troops or to yeah. immediately initiate line formation. Yeah. So first thing you do is everybody takes cover. And then once you do that, they say, Hey, uh rush up on the enemy or whatever. So then and that's the whole point of the leadership is that let's say you're the squad leader, you have your fire team leaders controlling their four guys or five guys, and then you control your fire team leader. So it's all the leadership thing. You as the squad leader, you're in, you're in, in control of everybody, but you want to micromanage every single Marine that's rushing towards the enemy. That's what you have your fire team leaders for, to manage their guys so that you don't have to worry about that. You can worry about the bigger picture, which is killing the enemy. Um, but yeah, you take cover first, and then they're like, all right, prepare to rush, rush, and then you guys just start moving in on the enemy. Yeah, I'll make sure to, I'll make sure to draw a bunch of diagrams towards the end of this too, or as I go, but I'm going to go over some of these squad formations because I want to show – I know that the fire team formations, this is literally it. I mean, I'm hoping that that's not too challenging for you guys, and I want to move into the bigger ones, the squad formations, because um, – I think I think most of you are going to breeze through Sully One, and I think Sully Two is going to be aware of some of you. Um, you know, you're already hurting. You're like six or seven weeks into OCS, so you're like just trying to stay alive. <laughs> some of you, some of you yeah, might find it really easy. I don't know. We'll see. But they're definitely more challenging than Sully One because you're controlling 13 people instead of uh, instead of three others. So, squad leader, their job is basically the same as the fire team, but you're in charge of three fire teams instead of three individuals. Um, and he's supposed to position himself or, her, or herself in the best in the best position to control the unit. So you're not supposed to be in the front or to all the way to the left or to the right. You're supposed to be somewhere where you can control all three of your fire teams and make sure that they're doing their jobs. Fire team leaders make subsequent changes to their fire team formations. Yeah, so as a squad leader, you're only supposed to tell them, okay, I want you to switch to a uh, fire team wedge, you know what I mean? Or fire team skirmishers. You don't tell them, uh, the individuals what to do you're not supposed to have to but I, you know I, I usually had to tell people you know I want you to spread your guys out to the right and I want you to spread them out to the left you know what I mean and then I need you to speed up I need you to slow down sort of commands like that as you go about your attack uh, yeah they're basically the same thing as fire team uh, formations but you'll see some differences here so the symbol for the different fire teams is just this little circle with a dash through it. And then there's there's our uh, squad leader symbol again that we were using. Um, so fire team columns, three columns in a row. So you have three fire teams, but these guys, they can be stacked up like they are in Forrest Gump where they're kind of walking like this and two just columns are on each side of the road or whatever it is. Or you could even have uh, wedges if you really wanted to. No one's going to tell you that that's like a really bad thing to do. It doesn't really matter. It's like they're both fire like you, but you what you tell them is you say I want squad column, fire team, either wedge or columns. So I'm going to say wedge. This is fire team. This is that. Fire, uh, squad column, fire team, wedge. And that's how you call the commands. Uh, squad column, control. Fire maneuver to the flanks. So yeah, when you're walking in columns, you obviously have a lot of fire facing both sides, but not a lot to the front and back. 
but you have a lot of speed in the front and back directions. And it's really easy to control it because everyone's lined up in a row. So it looks pretty nice. Here's a squad column, squad column, fire team column. And you can see the squad leaders between between one and two, between the first and second fire teams. And everyone here is supposed to be maintaining that dispersion because we're doing social distancing, you know what I mean? Um, there's also some wedges. We'll go over wedges now. And it's it's not really at the same diamond shape. It's more like just a triangle. I feel that's that's like kind of how I remembered it. And then the squad leader kind of moves around and talks to each of the fire team leaders as he goes. So you can do squad wedge, fire team wedge, or you can do. Uh... Oh, that's actually the only one I would really do. That's the only one I would recommend that you do. So if you were to draw the dots, you'd have one wet fire team wedge, and then you'd have another one over here. And then another one over here. And then you have your squad leader. And that's how you would move through the forest. What this does is it gives you more security, uh, flexibility, and you can spread out more or you can contract if you have to. Uh, fire in all directions. So you have two machine gunners in the rear, one in the front. That's a pretty good front. And then you can get everyone online if you really had to and spread out and make a sort of a 180 security right there on the spot. Here's what it looks like. Oh, I didn't have to draw it. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see all the fires are, or not where the fires, yeah, all the fires are in the room. And all the fire team leaders, it's kind of hard. This guy over here, he should probably be on this side. Uh, and these guys should swap positions. That way the uh, squad leader can communicate with them better. But that's just personal recommendation. The last one is uh, squad line. This is when you're already getting ready for the attack or you've already been attacked. You'd want to get everyone all in a straight line. And you can do that in wedges or call or uh, skirmishers. It's not really up to you. But this is when you have the most firepower to the front. Enemy strength and location is known. Basically, the only time you're going to know the enemy location precisely is when you're being attacked. Or if you see them visually, but usually you'll get attacked first. And this can be very difficult to control, mainly because you might have, I'll just draw it on this diagram. No, I won't. Okay, so here's a squad line fire team wedge. Still maintaining pretty good security because you have those 360 security on each of those units. The one I really like is squad line fire team skirmishers. And this is where everyone's getting ready to buddy rush. And this this is different. Here, I'll zoom out. This one is better than the fire team wedge squad line because as you can see these two guys are stacked up on each other these guys here and they can't actually both fire and this is your fire guys these are the guys that are have the the heavy machine guns or the light machine guns and they're, they're supposed to be your they're supposed to have most of your firepower and they're blocked by your readies so it doesn't make much sense to have them positioned right behind them each other it makes much more sense to have these guys stacked up in the front. That's the way I would do it. Um, let's see. Echelon left and right. I still don't see the purpose of using echelons personally, but it's the same exact thing. So if you're doing echelons left, if you call an echelon left, whether it's squad or uh, fire team, it means most of your firepower is to your left. And if you call it right, that means most of your firepower is to your right. So here, the squad leader calls squad echelon, uh, fire team wedge maybe. That means you have two fire teams to your left, one to your right, and that means it's a squad, it's an echelon left, not an echelon right. Echelon right would look like this. Not much of a difference. Can't draw it very well. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is very difficult to control, and it's very slow. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and say that I didn't see anyone try this formation personally at OCS. And if you would try it, if you did try it, it would probably end up turning into a squad line anyways when you're assaulting an enemy. Because that would just, 
it would be very difficult to have this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here on an enemy position. It would be much better to have them all even front. But this is what it looks like. Pretty simplistic. These are all wedges. Okay. Squad V. I didn't see anyone use this one either because I always thought it would make more sense to have the guy in the front, the third fire team, or the first fire team, whichever. But it does give you security to the rear. And uh, why would it do that? I'm not sure why it would be better for the front. I feel like having a fire team in the front here would be better. So that's another one I don't really understand why you would want a fire team behind you when you're assaulting in a forward position. But it does give you 360 security. But this is also an option, yeah. If you wanted to do this one at OCS, perfectly good option. There's your fire team leaders. This guy should be over here again. Chain formations. Uh, the fire team leaders. They choose their positions or they get the orders from the squad leader and then they're supposed to maintain that formation until orders change from the squad leader. And you're supposed to use hand and arm signals until uh, until you reach contact and then you can start using your voice. And I'll cover that towards the end. I don't want to cover how to change positions yet or what to what to do in response to being attacked. I'll cover that towards the end because that's kind of like I have to draw more. Uh, yeah, this is just basic security measures. Dispersion based on situation, control and visibility, assign sectors of observation. That's another important thing at OCS. When you assault the enemy and you kill the enemy and you're making a big circle around them with your whole squad, each person has a triangle view of what they're supposed to be watching. And the squad leader has to assign that to each of the fire teams. And each of the fire team leaders has to assign that to their individual team members. And that's something you can actually get deducted points for not doing because they're checking to make sure that you do it correctly. And this is called your hasty 180. Did we cover hasty 180 in the, in, in the five paragraph order class? You guys, nobody? I think I think we kind of did, but I'll try to cover it again. I'll go through a whole um, formation throughout the whole thing. Yeah, so there's not much to it. This is just how they organize their squads and fire teams. And when you go to OCS, this is what they're going to teach you and that use to evaluate you to make sure that you can um, lead a small unit. That's why it's called a SULI, small unit leadership evaluation, right? Oops, I can't spell for nothing. Remember, when you guys are at OCS, the staff doesn't expect you to be rifle platoon commanders, like completely experts on tactics and everything. They just expect you to try to show that you have a basic understanding of what you're doing and to put forth that effort. Because they want to, like he said, you have the ability to potentially lead Marines. It's, it's a whole screening process. Yeah. Looking back on... Suli 2 in hindsight um because Suli 2 is like the event that requires you that is required of you to graduate from ocs one of the main things it's like the crucible for the enlisted guys um looking back on it me and one of my buddies here that um was from the oso with us lieutenant piotrowski we were saying that we don't think any of us would have failed Suli 2 as long as we were trying. People that didn't try, um, I've heard of one guy that completely had no control over his squad at all, had no control during Suli 2, but his order was killer. So he passed Suli 2, even though his mission sucked. So um, just try to learn this stuff as much as possible. And you guys are already ahead of the game just by learning it now and having Martinez teach it to you because when you get there, 
there's going to be guys that have no idea what a five paragraph order is. And they told this to me when I was a candidate at the OSO um, that, yeah, you're going to show up there. There's going to be guys that have never heard of a five paragraph order. And sure enough, none of my buddies have ever heard of it. So pay attention to this stuff. Get what's that? I never heard of it before I went. <laughs> yeah. See, there's lots of people that don't know it, but because I was in the program for two years, I heard plenty about the five paragraph order, took time to know it, and it helped me a lot. Yeah, it, it takes time, guys. So I feel like you probably, all of you probably already forgot what a squad column is or what it looks like or how to draw it, but that's fine. I think you're going to kind of understand it intuitively over time. Um, and by the way, a squad column is just three of the disease. That's how I remembered it. <laughs> and you draw each of the little characters for each of the people. But you're going to forget it, and then you're going to remember it again. And when you hear it the second time, you'll just know it. You'll just have it down. Uh, right here, there's more slides about the Marine Rifle Squad. And there's the mission of the Marine Rifle Squad, which is pretty simple. I'm sure you guys could guess it, or you'd even know it intuitively before this class. The mission of the Marine Corps Rifle Squad is to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver, or to repel the enemy's assault by fire and close combat. That's pretty explanatory. I think most of you already kind of could guess that. I think Brandon put a question in the chat. Is that new or is that old already? Oh, yeah, that's new. Brandon said, for Sully 2, can a platoon leader move between his squads to ensure they are doing the needs to be done, or does he stay static relative to the formation? Well, it's uh, really too, it's not at a platoon level, it's at a squad yeah. level. So the most people that you'll control at OCS is a squad. However, yes, they specifically tell you, you need to maintain command and control of your squad. So if that means moving a little bit between, yeah. But they also want the um, fire team leaders to be maintaining communication with the squad leader it's their job to do so and provide him constant feedback on what's going on yeah thank you you don't you don't do platoons level stuff until you get to tbs and um uh, yeah you do platoon level stuff there here you're just a squad leader and yeah we can go over the five paragraph order again because i already know everyone's going to mess it up but um but your your instructor, the person evaluating you, is mimicking a platoon leader. Oh God, I can't spell. He's the instructor, right? And he's reading you his uh, op order, and you're pretending to be squad leader of first squad, usually. That's you. That's Sully too. So when you're reading, when he's reading you the order and you're writing it down, you're the squad leader. And if you're doing Sully one, then you're the fire team leader and he's mimicking a squad leader. So you never go higher than that, but you will at TBS. So it's important to know that as well, yeah. Um, organization. I don't think I need to go over all of this, but Platoon, each platoon, platoon commander, which is the lieutenant, platoon sergeant, which is usually like a staff sergeant or a gunnery sergeant. And then you have your corpsman. I'm pretty sure each platoon has a corpsman. I think that's how it's scheduled. Um, three squads of three fire teams. And it works all the way up the chain of command. So you'd have like, you'd have a division. Division commander is like a general. And then I'm pretty sure, what is it? It's regiments. And he's in charge of three of those. And it's usually, there's usually a lot of attachments and detachments at that level because a division can have like all kinds of armored units and all kinds of other crap. Um, but for us, let's just say he has three infantry regiments and then he has, um, what is it? Battalions. Tell me if I'm wrong, Melville, but I'm pretty sure this is how I, I learned it. And then the battalion has three companies each, three infantry companies at least. You're just talking about in general. Yeah, just like infantry, not not like all the other stuff, right? Because sure. each, each battalion will have like all kinds of like S and S and H companies or whatever. Yeah. 
but just infantry. Infantry division has three regiments, and then that has three battalions, and then that has like three companies, and then three platoons. Oh god, I can't even spell. Sorry, guys. And it gets more in depth once you get here to just the stuff that's attached to them, what's organic to the rifle platoon, um, all that stuff. And then I'll put individuals. Yeah, that's that's literally how it goes, like right there. I think that I someone told me this ditty. And in order to remember all this, you kind of just remember Derby Company. I've oh, wait, never heard of that before. No? Mm -mm. Divisions, regiments, battalions, companies. Oh, okay. Good way to remember. I'll just get rid of that. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't even really learned all that yet. Oh, I can't delete it. Okay. Okay. Let's get back to the business. Marine squad consists of three fire teams. Each fire team is four people. So you have three times four, which is 12, plus the squad leader, 13 Marines total. Uh, squad leader. Organization will all make sense to you guys once you get there because when you arrive at OCS, you get put into a specific company and then a specific platoon from there you get assigned squad fire team all that stuff yeah well you're even assigned to a battalion you're assigned to the training battalion um we're right? plc right yeah we, no. you, you were are plc or no i think plc and occ are all combined into the same battalion or yeah they're just um, I'm just talking about for their organization at OCS. Mm -hmm. They just have to worry about, hey, I'm Delta Company, I'm Alpha Company. Oh, yeah. I'm in yeah. whatever platoon, that type of stuff. Yep. Yeah, I won't, I won't get into that anymore. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's a little varsity level. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to spread out the information a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm not covering it the exact same way OCS does. Um, I mean, they wouldn't even cover squad tactics and, and um, fire team tactics on the same day, you know? They would just... It's oh, all... I'm not gonna, what's that? It's just all very basic stuff. Um, like I said, it's just make sure you guys get down all the formations and then what each one is good for. I believe that's some of the test questions there is what's the benefit of, like, a column, what's the benefit of whatever. And... Yeah. uh you just have to do it. Like when I was at Suli 1, Suli 2, I would just say, hey, let's do, well, let's say Suli 1, which is fire team level. I would say, hey, we're going to do um, fire team wedge. And then I would hit a certain point, be like, all right, we're going to switch to fire team column. Just if you just switch them, it, it, it essentially is telling the staff, hey, I know what I'm doing. And I hit the certain point, so I'm recognizing that I have to change up my formation. And just by changing it to whatever, it doesn't have to be the right one necessarily. But as long as you show them, yeah, I'm aware that I have to keep my team in a certain formation for certain areas, then you're going to get those points for that. Yeah. This is this sort of stuff right here covers the test questions sort of material. Um, Grades and duties, squad leader, senior man, usually of the class, class of a sergeant, uh, carries out the platoon commander's orders and responsible for discipline, appearance, training, control, conduct, welfare of his squad, uh, condition, care, econ economic, economical use of his weapons, and uh, commander squad issues orders and ensures that they are obeyed, responsible for the tactical deployment, fire discipline, and fire control of his squad. Fire team leader is lower than him, corporal usually, carries out his orders, the squad leader's orders, um, carries out the order of the squad leader, positions himself where he can best observe and control the fire team and carry out the order of the squad leader, responsible for the fire team's fire discipline, 
fire control, conditions, care, economic, economic use of weapons and equipment. Normally stays close to the automatic rifleman to effectively control his fire. Uh, the senior fire team leader is assistant squad leader. Here, I'll be right back to you. I'm sorry. While we're waiting for him, does, does anybody have any questions so far about anything about OCS, TDS, uh, getting selected for OCS, anything like that? Or who in here has gotten selected and is heading to OCS? I believe that they actually canceled the summer class, is what the rumor is. Anybody can confirm that at all? And confirm they canceled the uh, OCC summer. Okay, are they still doing PLC? Yes. Okay. Who in here has gotten selected? Damn near everyone. Everybody in here has got selected. Chase Myers is new, brand new, but everyone else is. Sorry awesome. about that, guys. September is the best time to go, so I would not even be mad about that at all. That's when I went, and uh, I couldn't even imagine going through OCS any other time. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. Um, let me finish these up and then we'll go through how to change tactics real quick. Um, sorry about that, I had to go pee. Um, automatic rifleman, he's second in command after, well, he's usually second in command after the fire team leader. And he's usually one step lower, a lance corporal. And he's responsible for the saw. And he assumes the fire team leader position if necessary. Uh, assistant automatic rifleman, he could be the same level. I've heard, I, I think it was uh, one step lower than him as well. Uh, it was kind of like an asterisk. What is it? Yeah, I think this mostly just depends on how well supplied the unit is. But usually Lance Corporal or just a, uh, what is it called? A PFC, even. And down here, you'd have a private and a PFC as well for the rifleman, the lowest level guy. And usually we made him in responsible for uh, for the compass and navigation. And he would also be the one counting his steps. So that's how you get around. You have someone do a pace count and they count their steps. And after a certain number of steps, you translate that to distance and you kind of know how far you've been. So I think for me, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, it was like 60 steps is equal to 100 meters, something similar like that. So the, the guy who's in the front, who's always in the front is the, usually the pace counter. And he uh, he tells you that count every time you reach 100 meters or every time you cross 50 meters or whatever it is. Uh, and at OCS, you will do a pace count. You do that You do that just so you everyone has their own and you have to record I highly it. recommend, I highly recommend doing that and learning how to do basic land nav before you ship out. If you guys have time. I, I didn't learn that. Yeah. Yeah, if I didn't learn that at uh, mini OCS, I probably would have had no idea what the hell was going on at OCS. This slide is actually pretty old. Uh, I'm not going to go over this. It, this is actually from like 2003. So this slide's a little bit out of date because these guys have a bayonet and this guy has a grenade launcher. But at OCS, when you get there, you're all going to be the same. So I wouldn't worry about that yet. Um, okay. I want to go over the tactics or the, the, uh, positions one more time and then how to change them if you have to. So let's say that you're at a squad level. Let's say you're at squad, uh, let's say wedge. Looks like you got a question here, Martinez. Okay. What do we got? Let me see. Uh, basic land nav in the future. Yeah, we, we really should. The thing is though, I you probably guys, can't get uh, compasses. Yeah, I was about to say, do you guys have a lensatic added compass there or no? We might have like one, but um, for one, I don't really want to go to the office and ask for it because of quarantine. And two, yeah. I don't, we definitely won't, won't have enough for everybody. 
but we can do the class and I can teach you how to like kind of do it, but you won't really know until you practice it yourself. Um, but even covering all the lecture material might help. So yeah, yeah I would say even being able to see one and see what the different parts of it are, because yeah. you guys not only do day land nav at OCS with the, you'll learn about the cheat cold method and all that, but also the compass, the little dials on it glow in the dark, and that's how you do night land nav. That's an important thing to know. So um, pace count is important if you guys are able to do it on your own. Um, and you could just teach them, hey, measure out 100 meters. So I guess roughly the length of a football field, a little bit, little bit over, or I'm sorry, a little bit under. And uh, you just, you start walking and every time your left foot hits the ground, that's one. Right foot hits the ground, don't count. Left foot, two, three, four. You do that for 100 meters. And however, however many times your left foot hits the ground for 100 meters, that's what your pace count is. Yeah, we can go over that. I'll make sure to go over that. Um, so I wanted to show like kind of like an example. Let's say you're in a fire team wedge, uh, squ or squad wedge, fire team wedge, right? So you have these three guys here and you take contact from the enemy. Boom. Oh, shoot, it's not drawing. Boom, you just got shot at, right? So these guys are, are in wedges. These guys are stacked up on each other. You don't want that to be that way. Um, as a squad leader, something I would do is, well, the second you hit contact, everyone gets on the ground. Like, that's just like a given. You just get on the deck and you, um, you're not you're not trying to fire yet. You're just taking cover. Uh, what I would do is I'd start telling, I'd start yelling at this guy, tell him spread your troops up and get on line, right, and form that line. And I would tell them the same thing. And then after they do that, then I would probably tell these guys to do the same thing. Have this guy scoot out this way as well. And now you have yourself like a little bit of a, of a skirmishers even though it's a little bit messed up it's not really going to matter too much as long as you can continue that spacing and keep that command but it's okay if it's not perfect but just don't have everyone start walking around you know what i'm saying you have to have a uh, control and someone has to be maintaining fire while other people are moving so don't have everyone move at once uh, maybe i'll draw a fire team one just to make it easier Right, so you're in a fire team wedge. You get contact from the enemy. You can do all kinds of stuff, right? You can do whatever you want. You're in control, but I would usually just have this guy scoot out over here while everyone else maintains position. And then once they're kind of like in that sort of line, then I would start buddy rushing. And if we haven't covered buddy rushing, basically what it is, is, uh, let me see, I'll use a highlighter. These guys are buddy pairs and these guys are buddy pairs. And what they're doing, Doing is the guy who's closer to the enemy at any given time. These guys are laying down fire. They're firing at the enemy. They're going bang, bang, bang. And then these two guys, while these guys are firing, these guys are moving to another position. And you never want to move. You don't want these guys moving. You, you don't want them moving when the other guys are not firing. And you don't want these guys firing when these guys are not moving. You want it to happen simultaneously. So it takes a little bit of practice. And you have to know your squad members pretty well in order to make it work good. Um, and then let me do some erasing and make it look a little nicer. Okay, so now you have these guys up here, right? Okay. These guys are up here. Now these guys are going to be firing. And these guys are bounding forward. You see what I'm saying? And you do that, you continue to do that, and you do it really quickly until you cross the enemy. And I'm gonna just go ahead and skip skip ahead here. But what basically happens is you're gonna cross past the enemy probably about uh, 10 meters, right? And you don't have to be perfectly in line. 
it's not it's not super important that you're perfectly aligned perpendicular or whatever or parallel you can be a little bit spaced out it's not it's not perfect it's never going to be perfect because you're out in the woods and virginia is really wooded and it's really swampy so you're never going to get it perfectly accurate but as long as you cover the enemy like that past about five meters they're going to tell the uh, instructor is going to tell you uh enemy neutralized when he says enemy neutralized that's your little ditty and it tells you that you can jesus takes forever to draw okay enemy neutralized what you do is you start setting up your hasty 180. And what that means is all four of you, and this is where people forget this as well, but you're each going to take up a position on this line and you're each going to have a sector of fire. And you're all going to be in the prone because you're in this position in case more enemy come and they try to attack you to reinforce their allies. So you need to set up that position and you don't need to worry about this position yet because you just came from there. So no one's behind you yet, okay? So after this after this happens, the next thing your instructor is gonna say is uh, no chance of enemy counterattack. That's, that's the exact word they're gonna say. When they say those words, that means, well, everyone's gonna repeat it, but what it means is that you set up your 360 security now, right? But the difference between this one is that you're going to, you're only going to have three people and the fire team leader is going to bound from each person and he's going to ask them to add a rack oh uh, what is it no not the add rack what's it called oh god no but what's it called no ammo no casualties no all equipment kind of report, report. Ace report. God dang it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, you asked the ace report. And the fire team leader will ask the ace report from each of his guys. And then the squad leader is going to ask ace report from each of his fire team leaders. And you report that information directly back to the instructor. So you ask everyone in your unit, whatever unit it is, ammos, casualties, and casualty means are they injured? And then you make sure all their equipment is counted for. So if it's at the fire team level, you as the fire team leader are going to each of your members. If it's at the squad level, the fire team leaders are going to each of their members and then going to the center to report to the squad leader. I'll draw it again too. Yeah. The reason we do an ACE report is to see where everybody's at. Hey, we just got in a firefight. We need to see, does everybody have enough ammo left just in case? Hey, the enemy comes back. They're going to attack us. Do we have any casualties because we need to get them out? Is all our equipment counted for? Do we have our radios? Whatever else we came with. That's pertinent information because if you don't have any of that stuff, like, hey, we're out of ammo, that's going to be an issue because we're in enemy territory. The enemy still could be coming. You have to call that up to hire and let them know, hey, we're out of ammo. Hey, we have a casualty. We don't have any comms. Well, you can't be calling up to hire if you don't have comms, but it's just giving them a sit rep on the situation after a firefight to let them know what your status is and if you could continue on. Yeah. At the fire team level, the fire team leader is going to, He's going to go to each of these members and tell them their sector of fire. And then he's going to ask them their ACE report. He's going to bound to the next guy and do the same thing, bound to the last guy. And then he's going to go to the instructor. And that's when you finish your solo. You tell him, you tell him the ACE report. And uh, basically, he'll tell you if you finished the mission or not. So if, you, if, if the mission was to resupply the enemy or to resupply your allies or to ex like, uh, evacuate a wounded soldier or something like that uh, and you destroy the enemy all you did was destroy the enemy you didn't accomplish your mission so you have to ask the instructor for permission to continue the order uh, and if you tell the instructor that you accomplished your mission but your mission wasn't to destroy the enemy your mission was to resupply then 
you look bad and you'll lose points for that because you didn't actually accomplish whatever you were supposed to do. So these are important things to remember. Um, do the hasty 180. That's what the ditty is. I'll cover this more on Saturday too. I have the document for it. Hasty 180. That's when you do the 180 degree security. And then you do, uh, it's called consolidated 360. Oh God, I can't spell. I'm sorry, guys. Consolidated 360 because you're consolidating your troops and getting that 360 security and getting on the ACE reports to make sure that you have enough ammo and enough equipment, all that stuff. But you don't do that until after the mission. So here over here, I drew what it would look like at the squad level. And what you do is when you're an op order, you're going to assign first fire team. I want you to take uh, this sector. After we do the 360 second fire team, this sector, third fire team, this sector, that's going to be part of your concept of operations or part of your, uh, yeah, part of your concept of operations. And if you notice here, I only drew three dots because the fourth fire team leader, he's doing, he's doing what I said. He's grounding from person to person, and then he's going to go to the squad leader and he's going to tell them their race report. And once each of this happens for each of them, then the squad leader will go to the instructor. And that's really the end of your uh, squad level Suli, Suli 2. And that's when you know if you passed. Uh, let me see, what else am I missing? Go back like to sleep missing. after that. Yeah, after you do that, if you feel like you did a good job, I'd say that you're pretty close to completing OCS. That's like, that's like one of the hardest things you're gonna do. And during Suli 2, you're gonna walk like 20 miles that day at least after doing your nine mile hike. So it's it's like the hardest day, I'd say. Let's see. What am I forgetting anything, do, Melville? Yeah, I feel so like you do like five Sulis in a row in one week. You guys want to uh repeat anything? I know you guys have anybody have any questions about anything so far? I know you all have questions and you're not gonna say them. I know that for a fact. And you don't know you have questions. Let me just review the, the formation. So there's columns, right? Fire team column, it's just the Z. That's how I remembered it, okay? And the squad column is just three of them stacked, right? And then there's a uh, wedges, fire team, just a diamond. And then you have your squad. Pretty simple, right? And then what's the other one? Skirmishers. It's actually called squad line. It's called fire team skirmishers, or it's called a uh, squad line. So fire team skirmishers looks like sideways -y. For me, I just remember skirmishers. It's it's literally the same thing as the columns. It's just the other direction. See what I'm saying? Very easy to remember that one. And then uh, squad line just looks like this. But the squads are aligned, but the people inside of them are still skirmished. They're still zigzagged. Okay. Uh, what's the other one? Is there another one? Oh, there's hasty 180. That's very important. You guys remember that? We just did that. Right? Fire team. If you're doing hasty 180 and it's squad level, you just slice in that pie. You know what I'm saying? But you got to maintain that dispersion. But you have all the fire team members on the floor. And the squad leader can be somewhere in the middle here. Um, and then there's consolidated 360. Oh, God, I can't split that into fours. What am I doing? 
Okay. One team member each. If it's if it's fire team level, one fire team each. If it's squad level. I feel like there's more to cover. I don't remember exactly everything. But I think that's mostly it. It's really the bulk of it. I mean, after uh, OCS, I never heard of skirmishers or echelon ever again. No? Um, no. Here at TBS, we just use columns, wedges, or the V. That's about you guys it. use the V? Um, very rarely. I think I've probably used it one time, but it's mainly just column wedge, and it goes from like squad column or platoon column, squad wedge, stuff like that. You just kind of could do a combination of them because it's really heavily wooded out here, uh, really just thick, dense woodland areas. So you got to decide hey, what formation is going to be the best for getting through these woodlands? And you're also going up hills. So something to keep in mind. You guys will learn all that once you get over here to TBS and pass OCS. You'll get an idea of what you have to do in different situations. I have this picture that I found of uh, the uh, first Marine Division, different regiments. Yeah, that's how I remember it. I really do remember it like that, Derby Company. You have D, uh, R, B, and then all the companies. Company, uh, platoon, quad. But you have all this extra stuff as well. We should probably go over a class with uh, Marine Corps organization because that's very boring. That's very hard to learn on your own. <laughs> very, very hard, very dry. Uh, they very also dry. have a class on it at TBS as well as so CS, so oh, I'm sure um, you have yeah. to take quizzes and online classes on it too. It's pretty extensive. That might be helpful for me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, just to go over it again. But yeah, here's all the. Sure. You have HQ companies, different batteries, uh, light arm work recon, and then regular recon, engineer battalions, all kinds of cool stuff. It's really interesting. It's really big. It's really it's it's a really big organization. If you guys have this link to my drive, I have all kinds of extra shit in here that you guys can start reading anytime you want. Uh, if you want to become a sniper, this is the straight up USMC FM FM one three. Or this one's really useful too. And whenever I find a good PDF, I put it in here. Just whatever I can find. And if you guys find good books too, post them in here as well. Um, I don't know. Do you guys want to go over the op order stuff or is it pretty much good? Because we're what time is it? It's already past six. So what is something that any of you have been dying to know about OCS? Give me one good thing. Yeah, I'll share the link. Um, where's the link at? No one's dying to know anything. That's good. <laughs> Maybe. Nobody wants to know how much sleep you get on an average night. I don't get that. I, I never got that much. It wasn't bad, though. All right. It's nice and shared. Um, I'm not going to go over the outporter stuff. We'll go over it on Saturday if you guys want. All right. It's all kind of tough stuff to really just – nobody really understands it their first time seeing it. Um, like I've said in a previous class, though, is that the whole point of the five paragraph order, it's like an instruction manual on a mission that you're gonna go do. That's the most basic way I could put it. And each part of OSMIAC is the different parts of that instruction manual so that you could understand it. It's like, essentially like the who, what, when, where, and why, and how. 
because I remember when we went out to the CHP Academy doing buddy rushes and stuff back at the OSO office. Um, they introduced us to the five paragraph order. I didn't know what the hell it was. It took me pretty uh, quite a while actually to really understand what it was and break it down and apply it. But if you guys just keep getting reps at it, practice, 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 you'll know exactly what to do before you even ship out to OCS. Um, and I'm sure they could uh, find you guys some little orders to to help you write your five paragraph order. Make sure you have that skeleton written out. And one one thing that I did that helped me at OCS was that I took a picture of a good skeleton on my own before I went to OCS. And then once Libo came around, I looked at my phone and I made a skeleton on a piece of binder paper on the weekend at Libo, taped that up and uh, used it for there in class so that I have the legit one from back at home and it's not all based on memory. You guys, I'm gonna just, I don't know. I, I don't wanna keep you guys too long. I'm gonna go through this. You guys are welcome to leave if you have to or whatever you're doing. Um, I'm gonna go through it one more time, just real quick. Orientation usually has four parts, two grid coordinates, present, location, objective location, and these are eight digit grid coordinates. Oh God, I'm talking and writing. Objective location, key terrain, and what was the fourth one? I forgot. Oh, direction of attack, DOA. Direction of attack. Uh, those four things, and the thing about orientation is it's always is it's typically I'd say ninety percent of the time it's a direct copy from the person reading you their order. So you don't have to worry about it. Whatever they're saying, write it down. That's it. Situation, same thing. It's broken down into three parts. Enemy, which is uh oh god, what is it? T Swally. I know you guys probably remember it. I'm not sure if you remember it, but I'm not gonna ask you to like answer questions. Time, size, unit, activity, location, equipment. And there's also draw a D. Okay, this is what they're gonna do when you attack them. It's just one little thing. Uh, defend, reinforce, attack, withdraw, delay. Then there's friendly. Remember friendly as has. Higher adjacent supporting units. And then there's also ATT, DET, attachments, detachments. Mission, everyone knows mission. It's the five W's or is the six W's? I don't remember who, when, where, why. And you repeat it twice. And you have to say on order at the beginning. On order. And then when you get to the Y, the Y is always last and you say, in order two. Another important thing is uh, actually before you say on order, you always say the main effort. So if you're a fire team leader, let's say you're in charge of fire team one. First fire team LDR, that's you, right? Then you say first fire team, we are the main effort. So you tell them who the main effort is. Main effort, on order, you're gonna do this in order to facilitate this. That's what you do. Execution, I'll go back to that. I'll, I'll, I'll scroll down, because that's fat. Admin and logistics, four Bs, right? The thing about admin and logistics is you should already have that written the night before. For silly one and for silly two, and even for LRCs, you really don't need to write anything down. You should have it already written or at least memorized before you even start the uh, event, because it's just it's just your food, 
bullets. You can probably just make up a number of bullets if you don't know for sure. Or if you're doing LRCs, I'm pretty sure you don't have any bullets. So if you know you're doing LRCs the next day, no bullets. Simple. Beans bullets, band-aids is always Corman aid or a self-aid buddy aid. And then uh, bad guys, which is your five S's and a T, which is how you're gonna treat the enemy EPWs. I personally always said no EPWs. And no one ever questioned me on it. But what it means is that you're not taking prisoners. Um, and because this is just a small leadership evaluation, uh, that's that's not like a problem. Command and signal. We always did havoc. For my LRCs though, when I did LRCs, I used a uh, low voice because you don't want to tell them that you're going to only use hand and arm signals, and you're trying to get logs across like a bridge. If you tell them that you're only going to use hand and arm signals and you end up using your voice to tell them how to do stuff then you just got you just deducted yourself points for no reason because you could have used your voice but you specifically said in your order that you weren't going to use voice now you can't you you made your own rules and you you failed at it so don't make your own rules use low voice if you have to um and for lrcs that's really useful because you're you're trying to accomplish small missions and they're usually not combat related. Uh, what else goes in here? Command under this is signal. Signal is hand and arm, voice on contact. That's when you're using hand and arm signals and you're signaling each other without talking. Low voice is when you're just talking to each other. Man, it has succession of command. And key leader location. Both of these, you can just kind of guesstimate as you go. So succession of command, I would never worry about it. If I was a squad leader, I would just say, if I go down, I want first, second, and then third squad uh, fire team leaders to take command. Simple, done. Key leaders are always located at the HQ. Bam, you don't even need to write those down really. You could just kind of have that ready to go. Execution is the hard part. I'm gonna go back to that because this is your bread. This is really where you spend most of your time. This is really where the bulk of it is challenging and people get confused and they don't know what to do and they start writing stuff down in the wrong spots and it's incorrect oh god it's not loading all right let me cover this real quick hire a unit when you put hire a unit if you're receiving an order from your platoon leader so you're a squad leader that's where it goes when they say mission the mission moves here. Okay. But the, the instructor is going to tell you higher. They're going to read out loud part of this, but don't write that down. That's useless to you. Your adjacent units, those come from your tasks. So when, you, when, the, when your instructor is reading you the tasks, that's where you get your mission and you get your adjacent unit missions. Hey, Mark Gines, I'm gonna head out now. Um, yeah, we're if you guys have any questions, I'm in the candidate group chat. Feel free to hit me up if you wanna private message me or whatever. And uh, probably be joining in on some of your guys' later classes whenever you have them, if we have time out here. I'll catch you guys later. Peace, man. Um, okay, last time we were going over concept of operations, right? Scheme of maneuver is where you tell them your, your form of maneuver, which is your type of assault, penetration, envelope, assault, frontal, uh, flanking maneuver, whatever it is. And then you go over your TCMs, your tactical control measures. And your tactical control measures, it seems really daunting, but it's really just you're telling them, okay, that we're going to start off. I drew it here last time as well. Um, okay, we're going to start off in a column formation, when we get to this certain grid coordinate, really, really, I just use distance. So after 50 meters, oh, I even wrote it here, yeah, from last time. After a certain distance, we're gonna change our formation into a wedge. 
after a certain distance. If they don't have to do the same distance, they could be different. After a certain distance, we're going to switch into a line. And we're going to stay in this position until we defeat the enemy. And once we defeat the enemy, we're going to do a hasty 180, and then we're going to do consolidated 360. Um, that's that's basically it. But you have to say all that inside of your uh, scheme of maneuvers. And notice that when I said all that, I never mentioned who's doing what. OK, that's the difference between the scheme maneuvers and the, the, uh, the task. So in your scheme maneuvers, when you're telling them the different formations at different times, um, that's exactly what you're doing. So you're telling them, okay, we're going to walk 50 meters. We're going to do uh, columns. We're going to get to this point. We're going to switch to a wedge. We're going to switch to a, a squad line after this point. We're going to do a, a hasty 180, and then we're going to do a 360. That's it. You get down here to your tasks, and that's right after. So it goes scheme maneuver. It goes scheme maneuver, and then right after that, you go to tasks. And you're not really repeating it. You're saying, um, you're you're kind of repeating it, but you're also not. So like, uh, your first fire team, you tell them, okay, I want this. I want first fire team. I want you to be in the front of the column, and then when we switch to a wedge, I want you to be in the middle. And when we switch to skirmishers, I want you to stay in the middle. Um, second and third fire teams. Second, I want you to be on the left at all times, and on third fire team, I want you to be on the right. Um, it's pretty simplistic like that, but you have to say it in the form of order. But I don't think you repeat it. I think I was wrong when I said that. I think we covered that on Saturday when I was wrong about it. But yeah, you do have to give it in the order format. So first fire team, you're the main effort on order. You will attack this, blah blah blah. The middle one third. Second fire team on order, you will do this. Third fire team on order, you will do this. It's just three separate orders. So when your instructor, when he's talking to you and you're the squad leader, you're they're, they're gonna read you the same format. So they're reading you a five paragraph order as well. Don't, don't you, Use their mission. The mission goes into higher, like their mission. Oh God, sorry guys. All right, I'm gonna let you guys go pretty soon. I'm sorry. Um, when the instructor says mission, that is not your mission. That becomes. Oh God, I drew that wrong. When the instructor says mission, that becomes the higher unit mission. Okay. And oh Jesus. All right. It's all glitched out, huh? Okay. Where are we at? When you get the tasks, first fire team, that's you. That becomes your mission. Okay. And these guys right here, second and third fire teams, or second and third squads, whatever it is. Those becomes your adjacent. And that's really all the translation you have to worry about. Um, it's just it's just those three things because the missions are getting flipped around a little bit. Everything else is basically directly co uh, copied or you come up with it on your own. But those are the things that get switched. But all right, I'm gonna let you guys go now. Do you guys have any questions about anything today? I know it was a little bit more floppy. I should have probably made my own PowerPoint instead of using that 2003 one, but um, I'll make sure not to do that again. It didn't cover everything I wanted to cover. It was kind of like a little bit off, a little bit different. Shouldn't have done that. Do you guys have any questions? Nothing? We got something in the chat. No questions? Yeah, it was fun. Uh, hopefully, you guys can use that stuff when we do Sully's next time. So we can, I can read you an op order and tell you, okay, uh, enemy lead location is unknown, and I want to see that you guys understand different formations. Okay, if the enemy's position is unknown, I have to use a wedge. You know what I mean? Or if the enemy position is unknown, your tactical control measures, you might stay in a wedge longer instead of switching from a column. So if, 
if you know where the enemy is, maybe you'll stay in a column longer and travel towards the enemy. If you don't know where he is, maybe you'll be in a wedge the whole time. And then you'll switch to skirmishers early because you know where the enemy is, you know, instead of letting it run into you. Um, but hopefully that helps clear up a little bit of the execution stuff. Um, okay. You guys are good? Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting and I'll put the thing on YouTube so you guys can watch it again if you want to. I know it was a little jumbly though. I'll try to be better. Um, all right, I'm going to end the meeting, okay, guys? All righty. Goodbye. <laughs>